May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Look around at this desolate valley, mortal. Look around and tell me, can these bones live? Do you believe that God has the power to breathe new life into this long, dead place? I've always loved this prophecy from the book of Ezekiel, the story of the Valley of Dry Bones. To me, it speaks beautifully and powerfully to a question that is central to every human heart. Do we really believe that God has this kind of redemptive power? It was likely written in the 6th century B.C. after the peak of the Babylonian and Assyrian conquests, after Jerusalem had been conquered by the forces under Nebuchadnezzar and much of its population had been removed to foreign lands. And so Ezekiel was an exiled prophet to an exiled people, which means in this case he would have known firsthand what this valley of dry bones looked and felt like. The sort of bleakness and desperation that's described in this story would have been very familiar to him and to his kindred. Not only had they been defeated by foreign captors, they had been disconnected and cut off without a hope and without a future. But through elaborate visions and divine revelations, Ezekiel could also picture in his mind's eye and proclaim what restoration might look and feel like, what it might mean to return to Jerusalem, to be restored to covenant relationship. He could picture and proclaim what it would be like to again be made to feel strong and secure in God's promise. And just like in this particular vision, many of Ezekiel's prophecies often include intricate representations of events that are beyond the scope of the normal human experience. They point to another level of existence where because of the transcendent power of God, things can happen that wouldn't make any sense to the human eye. In this way, then, God used Ezekiel as an intermediary so that in the midst of fear and alienation, he could call his people back through these incredible visions and prophecies, back from fear to faithfulness, back from a sense of hopelessness and desperation to a renewed belief that God can indeed act in mighty and redemptive ways. Because of Ezekiel's visions, they could see the possibility. They could catch a glimpse of this new reality, and they were then forced, in this case, to make a decision. Look around, this desolate valley mortal. Look around and tell me, can these bones live? Do you believe that God has the power to breathe new life into this long, dead place. It's worth noting that the Valley of Dry Bones is a metaphorical or an allegorical place in that it can mean something very different for anyone who hears it. The description is of a place that generally represents the experience of absence, brokenness, and despair. And specifically, we get to fill in the details as to what that means, what that looks like for us individually. Ellie Weissel, the famous Nobel laureate and Holocaust survivor actually once speculated that the reason this prophetic vision is not located precisely is because every generation needs to hear in its own time that, yes, these bones can live again. But let's be clear, it's not just an abstract location for the exiled Israelites. It is, in fact, a very real place. It's a battlefield, or more to the point, a series of battlefields where they would have witnessed brutal combat and suffered terrible losses and humiliating defeat all at the hands of foreign invaders. It's a place where they once dwelt proud and secure, a place that was a significant part of their history, their culture, and their identity, a place where there are now absolutely no signs of life, only utter physical and spiritual debility. And yet, in either sense, whether it's interpreted figuratively or literally, The point is that God needed for his people to see it. He needed for them to take a long, honest look at this terrible, awful setting. And he needed them to consider well why and how things ended up the way they did. Look at this desolate valley, mortal. Look around and tell me, can these bones live? Do you believe that God has the power to breathe new life into this long, dead place? It's also worth noting that the Hebrew word for live, which is used frequently in the book of Ezekiel, can be rendered to mean several different things. It can mean to come into being or to be made. It can mean to be revived from sickness or discouragement, and it can mean to be inspired to something greater. 
And to be fully alive for the Israelites, to be fully alive, was always to be fully connected to God in right relationship and to be aware of his presence and protective power. So it was only when they realized just how dry and desolate, how dead they had become, only when they saw it all up close and personal in gruesome detail, then and only then could they consider the question of whether the dry bones could live, the question of whether God could bring them back to life, to fullness of life. In this sense, then, this vision, this story, this prophecy is a call both to repentance and a call to renewed faith. Look at your long history of rebellion that sealed this grim fate, the Spirit of the Lord could have said. Look at just how bad things had gotten. Look at how sick, how off track, how disconnected you had become, and then watch. Watch the breath of God fill you again with his life-giving spirit. Watch him breathe a sense of worthiness and purpose into your dry bones, and not only bring you back to life, but give you a reason to live again. Watch the spirit animate you and set you in motion. Watch him get you back on track towards a life of dignity, freedom, peace, and lasting connection. And not only do I want you to watch it, I want you to be a part of it. I want you to help me make it happen. I want you to help me make things right again. Such beauty, such promise, such truth. What is not to love about this story? So what about this generation? What about this congregation? What about us individually? Where is our valley of dry bones? Where are the battlefields where we've suffered shame and losses? In what ways have we ceased to fully live specifically? Where did things go wrong? How did we get so far off track? We were reminded on Ash Wednesday, which feels like a lifetime ago, that the season of Lent has historically been used as a period of purification, a time when people who, because of notorious sins, had been separated from the body of the faithful could, through penitence and forgiveness, be reconciled and restored. But it's also a time for us to look at our own notorious and serious sins. It's a time for us to look fearlessly and honestly at the dried up, barren places in our lives and in our souls, to face them with courage and with a desire for change and renewal. It's a time for us to ask God to grant us the grace and the strength that we need to send us the gift of his spirit that we might see new life begin to emerge where there was once total desolation. New light begin to shine where there was once total darkness. And on this, the fifth Sunday of Lent, the last Sunday before we enter into Holy Week, we get not one but two lectionary texts that promise and foreshadow resurrection, new life. As one commentator noted, in Ezekiel, dry bones are knit back together and infused with life-giving breath. And in John, Lazarus is brought back to life after four days in the tomb. In neither case is resurrection life necessarily pretty, but in both cases it is life forged from death. In both cases, God takes a desperate, lost cause situation, something that can't be undone as far as our minds can comprehend, a place from which we think there is absolutely no return. And in both cases, we are asked, look around this desolate valley mortal, look around and tell me, can these bones live? Do you believe that God has the power to breathe new life into this long, dead place. The question always remains, do we really believe that God has this kind of redemptive power? And while it will not always be pretty, and it will not always be easy, the answer, the answer has always been and must always be yes. Yes, I believe, I believe because I have seen. Amen.
I will see. 